Hello, I'm Gary Anthony Ramsey, and you're watching Arise News Now, your fast forward to stories that affect you. Making headlines around the world in this half hour. As the George Zimmerman trial appears to be entering another stage of jury selection, what role has race played in the case, the trial, and eventually in the aftermath? Former U.S. transportation safety investigators make stunning allegations about the crash of an American jet 17 years ago. What are they saying brought down TWA Flight 800? Nelson Mandela's family says the 94-year-old is still recovering, but many disturbed by the circumstances of his treatment are asking the question, is it time now to set free the man who freed so many others? Intelligence officials say they have good reason to continue using the phone and Internet surveillance programs recently leaked to the press. And now the head of the FBI has revealed a new intelligence gathering tool being used right on American soil. Arise News' Debbie Turner Bell explains. Intelligence officials head back to Capitol Hill today for hearings on NSA's collection of phone and Internet data. On Wednesday, FBI Director Robert Mueller urged Congress to think twice before making changes to the program. If we are to uh, prevent terrorist attacks, we have to know and be in their communications. Mueller and others in the Obama administration are trying to make the case to Congress that these programs are needed. I'm most concerned about, about what's gone on in the last couple of weeks because of the lack of clarity in the public debate. Retired General Michael Hayden, the former head of the NSA, says some lawmakers, including Senator Rand Paul, are misguided in their beliefs that these programs invade Americans' privacy. If I actually thought NSA was doing what Senator Paul fears they're doing, I would be holding his coat for his next filibuster. More privacy concerns were raised Wednesday when FBI Director Mueller revealed for the first time that the agency has been using drones for surveillance. Does the FBI use drones for surveillance on U.S. soil? Yes. Uh, I want to go on to a question. And I, well, let me just put it in context, though, in sure. a very, very minimal way. He admits there are no rules in place to protect citizens' privacy, but says they are currently being written. Debbie Turner Bell, Arise News. Attorneys could wrap up jury selection today. Forty jurors have been asked to return for questioning where they could be grilled about their personal lives and their thoughts on the law. Our coverage of the killing of Trayvon Martin, the trial of George Zimmerman, continues. Rise News contributor Leela McDowell explains how the subject of race may affect the trial. Justice for Trayvon! Justice for Trayvon! The killing of Trayvon Martin has brought to the surface an often hidden conversation about race in America. Many have made comparisons to the murder of Emmett Till, a young black teen savagely beaten to death in the 50s. Others compared the racial divide around the Martin case to that of the trials of O.J. Simpson and the police accused of beating Rodney King. I could be the next Trayvon Martin. I'm asking you to fight to prevent young black males like me from becoming the victims of not just racist attitudes, but racist policies. A furor erupted when Sanford police decided not to initially arrest George Zimmerman, a decision based on Florida's Stand Your Ground law that allows deadly force if someone feels reasonably threatened. Now you're talking about a civilian with a record of attacking law enforcement who appoints himself as a neighborhood watchman, can shoot somebody and not even get arrested? Enough is enough. When the 911 tape of Zimmerman was released, it reinforced for many that Trayvon Martin was a victim of racial profiling. He's got his hand in his waistband. And he's a black male. Are you following him? Yeah. Okay, we don't need you to do that. If you know justice, if, if you know justice, justice, we know peace. We know peace. In American communities of color, the case exposed a deep sense of racial injustice and fear. 
Many black parents express concerns that their sons could end up like Trayvon Martin under similar circumstances. There may be some truth in those fears. The ACLU found that in New York, 84% of those that are stopped under the stop and frisk policy are young men of color, even though they're only 30% of the population. Blacks are four to six times more likely than whites to be arrested for marijuana, even though usage is the same. The University of Nebraska found that the ratio of blacks to whites being shot and killed by police is 10 to 1. 30 blacks have been killed this year. 30 at the hands of police security guards. 30. I don't know what happened because I wasn't there, but I don't think it was racially motivated. But on the other side of the shooting's aftermath is another kind of fear by whites who may be still afraid of blacks in America or of being labeled as racist for having that fear. We don't know what happened from the time George got out of his vehicle and the time that the gun went off. But I can tell you, race had nothing to do with it. In the weeks and months since the shooting, polls about what happened that night have largely been divided along racial lines. Robert Zimmerman has been outspoken in claiming that his brother is the target of so-called race baiters. Nonetheless, charges of racism have dogged the family. In March, Brother Robert apologized for two racist tweets. I realized those were controversial and offensive, and I did publicly apologize for them. I don't think it was the right thing to do that way. This week, Zimmerman's father's new book left little doubt that race will continue to be an overarching issue. He writes that African Americans are the true racists, singling out Trayvon Martin's parents' attorneys and organizations from the National Basketball Association and United Negro College Fund to the NAACP. He labels the Congressional Black Caucus a pathetic, self-serving group of racists and states that President Obama sought to exploit his son's case to gain advantage in the African-American community. Leela McDowell, Arise News, Washington. Taking a look now at some other stories making headlines across the United States. Stunning allegations are being made by former inspectors with the U.S. National Transportation Safety Board. 17 years after the flight of TWA Flight 800 crashed shortly after takeoff from New York. They say that it may have been a missile that brought down the doomed jet. A mix of former investigators and activists formally asked that the investigation into the crash be reopened. That crash killed 230 people on July 17th of 1996. An investigation concluded that a spark from a fuel pump ignited the center fuel tank and set off the massive explosion that brought the jet down. But in a soon-to-be-released documentary, some investigators say that conclusion was part of a massive cover-up by the FBI and NTSB. They suggest the flight was actually brought down by a missile from a nearby Navy ship, a theory that's been largely debunked by the initial investigation. If there is no new information and all this is is a rehash of the same old Internet conspiracies that have been running around out there for the last 17 years, um, that adds insult to injury for the family members. I mean, we, we uh, have been through a lot, and obviously to have this come up again on the 17th anniversary, acting like there's new information out there, um, could be, I mean, it's troublesome. Prosecutors in the September 11th war crimes case at Guantanamo Bay want the defendants excluded from pretrial hearings. They made the request as the five Guantanamo Bay prisoners returned to court Wednesday. The judge has not ruled on the demand. The defendants are accused of helping to orchestrate the attacks. Celebrity chef Paula Dean may be feeling the heat again. A former manager at Dean's restaurant in Savannah, Georgia, is suing her and her brother for sexual and racial harassment. The suit also alleges that Dean used the N-word. In the deposition, Dean has acknowledged using the N-word in the past, but denies ever telling racial jokes. Emmy Award-winning actor James Gandolfini has died. Gandolfini is best known for playing New Jersey mob boss in the cable TV hit series The Sopranos. Gandolfini passed away of a possible heart attack while vacationing in Italy. The actor was taken to a hospital where attempts to resuscitate him failed. Gandolfini was 51. You're watching Arise News Now. Twenty-four seconds. 
That's what you get to make it happen. You can run the break, find the big man inside, or swing it out and hit the three. Grab the board, and you get a new 24, just like that. But unfortunately, for endangered animals, there's no reset. Many are now facing extinction, and when their clock runs out, they're gone forever. So please, support conservation, and never buy products made from these animals. There's no more time to waste. Nelson Mandela's foundation is going ahead with plans to mark his 95th birthday next month, despite his ongoing hospital stay. The foundation said that on July 18th, the former South African president's birthday, charities, businesses, and individuals will all take part in a day of service called the Mandela Day Campaign. The 94-year-old remains in a Pretoria hospital where he spent nearly two weeks being treated for a lung infection. His daughter said Monday that the anti-apartheid icon was doing very well. But there's still no word on when he might be released, uh, which has well-wishers worried. In Soweto, outside Johannesburg, where many of the battles of South Africa's liberation struggle were fought, they've been celebrating. Once again, they've been told that 94-year-old Nelson Mandela is rallying from a serious health crisis. Mandela's daughter, Zanani, came out from visiting the man they call Madiba with apparently good news. How is Madiba doing? He's doing very well. He's doing very well. But South Africans have learned that such assurances aren't always what they seem. I think if you speak to individuals quietly, many will tell you that he's, you know, he's quite close to going. Nelson Mandela is revered, like no other, for setting his people free. But now, for family and political reasons, there seems to be a reluctance to set him free. As this recent controversial photo session showed, Nelson Mandela still has political value. South Africa's president, Jacob Zuma, was accused of trying to exploit that popularity. Mandela's longtime bodyguard, Sean Van Heerden, has begun to fear that the Mandela family and the government may be prolonging his boss's suffering. It's been more than two days since the last public comment on Nelson Mandela's health, and people have begun to fear that no news is bad news. Mandela family members are now said to be finally trying to decide how much medical intervention for an old and sick man is enough. Time now for a look at other stories capturing headlines around the globe in the Arise News Now World Wrap. The U.S. National Hurricane Center says Tropical Storm Barry is very close to Mexico's Gulf Coast and nearly set to make landfall with winds and drenching rains. Barry is the second tropical storm of the Atlantic hurricane season. A passenger bus skidded off a road and landed in a river in central Peru, killing at least 30 people and wounding 14 others. At least nine people remain missing. Bus accidents are very common in Peru due to reckless driving and poor road conditions. Seven Al-Qaeda-linked militants on a suicide mission attacked the UN compound in Mogadishu with a truck bomb, then engaged in a 90-minute gun battle, killing at least 13 people before dying in the assault. The United Nations says it will review safety plans and revisit if they have the resources to withstand a sustained assault from militants. Violent protests continued across Brazil. The rioters tried to set a moving bus on fire and then knocked it over. This as leaders in Brazil's two biggest cities, Rio de Janeiro and Sao Paulo, announced on Wednesday that they had reversed an increase in bus and subway fares a hike that ignited protests across the nation against the backdrop of the government spending billions on the World Cup and the Olympics. At least two people died and more than 150 others injured by several blasts that ripped through a two-story restaurant in a northern province of China. About a dozen firefighters were also injured by a final explosion during their rescue mission. And Pope John Paul II moved a step closer to sainthood a Vatican official says a commission of theologians approved a miracle attributed to his intercession, clearing a key hurdle. The case now goes to a commission of cardinals and then to Pope Francis. And that's your Arise News Now, World Wrap.
I came to Africa to see this. But I also found this. Every year, thousands of elephants are being killed just for their tusk. If we buy ivory, we're just helping the poacher. So please, don't do it. Because when the buying stops, the killing can too. In, in business news, there's some bit of good economic news, but it's causing the markets to act strangely. U.S. business editor Andrew Schmertz has the story. Markets around the world started the day significantly lower as bonds, shares, and commodities fell sharply and the dollar rose after the U.S. Federal Reserve explicitly signaled an end to easy money. Generally speaking, financial conditions are improving. The Fed improved its forecast for the unemployment rate across the board by about a quarter of a point to seven and a quarter percent by the end of this year and to about six percent in 2015. The main headwinds for the economy in the Fed's view come from Washington, where budget cuts are restraining growth. Our judgment is that, you know, given that very heavy headwind, the fact that the economy is still moving ahead at at least a moderate pace is indicative that the underlying factors uh, are um, are improving. If that continues, Bernanke says, the Fed will start to taper its stimulus program later this year. But interest rates will remain low. Most Fed governors do not expect to start raising rates again until at least 2015. Well, the IRS is caught in yet another controversy. As the agency says, it now has to pay $70 million in union bonuses. But some Republicans want the IRS to follow a White House directive and cancel them. In April, the Obama administration ordered all agencies to stop handing out bonuses because of the automatic spending cuts. And one of U.S. television's most popular retail pitchmen has been fired. George Zimmer is out as CEO of the Men's Warehouse. He started the company in Texas in 1973 and made it into one of America's largest men's clothing stores. He used the recognizable tagline, you're going to like the way you look. No reason yet as to why the company gave Zimmer the boot. And record-breaking heat in an unlikely corner of the United States. It's just another day at the beach in Anchorage, Alaska. That's right. Alaska's temperature soared into the 80s and 90s this week. They're calling it baked Alaska. And while it's a treat, it's no dessert. You're watching Arise News Now. Twenty-four seconds. That's what you get to make it happen. You can run the break, find the big man inside, or swing it out and hit the three. Grab the board, and you get a new 24, just like that. But unfortunately, for endangered animals, there's no reset. Many are now facing extinction, and when their clock runs out, they're gone forever. So please, support conservation, and never buy products made from these animals. There's no more time to waste. Two-thirds of the Earth is water. Can you swim? Here in New York on Tuesday, a lawsuit was filed against Mayor Michael Bloomberg and Police Commissioner Ray Kelly, among others, by the ACLU and the CLEAR Project at the City University of New York. The suit alleges the city conducted illegal surveillance of Muslim communities 
targeting them for, quote, discriminatory and suspicionless surveillance. The allegations have outraged the Muslim community. And for more on the suit, we spoke with Imam al Haj Talib Abdur Rashid. He's the Imam of the Mosque of Islamic Brotherhood in Harlem. I'm not only the Imam of the Mosque of Islamic Brotherhood, but I'm also the president of the Islamic Leadership Council of New York. And so I can say to you in no uncertain terms that there was a great deal of uh, upset, great sense of uh, betrayal of trust on the part of Muslim leaders throughout the city who since 9-11 have been opening the doors of their mosques uh, willingly uh, and warmly, I might add, to Police Commissioner Kelly. And give us a sense of just how widespread this surveillance program is. Very widespread. Uh, kind of wholesale surveillance of the Muslim community, monitoring houses of worship, sermons being given in houses of worship, Muslim student groups, trips by Muslim student groups. Uh, they went across the George Washington Bridge into New Jersey, mapping entire neighborhoods where there are Muslim uh, businesses. Probably the most extensive surveillance of this type since the days of COINTELPRO. What kind of effect did this have on the Muslim community when it came to light? Well, I would say a few different effects. Uh, many of our uh, uh, Muslim houses of worship that have populations, primarily that are immigrant populations, were very intimidated. Uh, uh, attendance in mosques went down. Donations went down. Great deal of uh, fear and uh, suspicion. And then those of us who are not immigrants, but are primarily African-American leadership, we had a tremendous sense of deja vu. You know, back in the 60s and 70s, it was the FBI and the federal government, and that type of surveillance was eventually outlawed. But now we find ourselves facing the same type of problem with the New York City Police Department. And I understand it even affected you as a cleric in, in how you minister to your people, how others prepared the messages for their people. Is that true? Uh, I would say that many of the imams, not all of them, but many of the imams uh, experienced that, yes. And again, that undermines the whole uh, purpose of uh, partnership with law enforcement for public safety. I mean, if imams are hesitant to speak openly about current events, to address matters like terrorism and what have you from the pulpit or in private counsel, then this undermines, again, our ability to partner with the police. Moving on now, we'll take a look at Arise News Now Sports. Soccer star and model David Beckham caused a stir during his recent visit to China and the Shanghai Tongi University. Fans there gathered and a stampede took place. Ten people were injured. Beckham was visiting the university to promote soccer on the campus. Tennis star Serena Williams, Serena Williams rather, apologizes for her controversial comments surrounding the 16-year-old victim in the Steubenville, Ohio rape case. Williams, who was quoted in a Rolling Stone article as saying the victim should have, quote, not have put herself in that position. She released a statement saying that, she supposedly, that what she supposedly said was insensitive and hurtful. 12-time Major League Baseball star Manny Ramirez has decided to leave the team he's been playing with in Taiwan. The Taiwanese team made the announcement Thursday saying that Ramirez misses his family in New York and wants to return home. You're watching Arise, well, lured by the lucrative work in cities overseas. And many of Nepal's traditional trekking porters, now those are the men who guide travelers through the dangerous mountain regions, have left the area. In their place, inexperienced and often ill-equipped young men who are flocking to the hills from the low-lying areas in search of a quick buck. And some say putting themselves and their traveling clients in danger. Charlotte Turner reports. Home to many of the world's highest peaks, Nepal is one of the most spectacular and popular trekking destinations. Thousands of tourists tread these trails each year, and often a good few steps ahead are local porters carrying their food, safety equipment, and camping gear. If I get on a good trekking group, I can earn up to $400 in one month. That's why I do this. Friends who had already done it told me it's a good way to earn money. I didn't know anything about the mountains before. Both young men are from low-lying parts of the country and are working their first season. In recent years, urbanization and labor migration 
have drained many rural Himalayan trekking regions of the men who have traditionally done the job. Those that do work as porters now tend to do so only for a limited time, then move on. Experts say the changing demographics may be making the excursions riskier, as well as endangering porters' health. They have no um, knowledge of how to carry safely. They have no knowledge of altitude. They have no mountain clothing. They have no mountain footwear. Um, so all of those things add up to very unhappy and uh, very ill-equipped and porters who are likely to get sick and to hurt themselves. Uh, and it's, it's not good for them, it's not good for the clients, it's not good for the trekking industry at all. The minimum porter's wage is around $8 a day as Nepal's economy struggles to recover from a civil war that ended in 2006, it's no longer seen as a decent profession, and many former porters are seeking higher wages abroad. For trekking agencies, finding portering staff is becoming increasingly difficult. Sometimes the only locals wanting to do the job are the children left behind. Most of the people, the porter from that village, went all Middle East and there is no any more porter left. So now uh, the students, small young children, they used to go uh, the porter as a porter. They make some more money for, the, for their schooling. Experts fear younger and inexperienced porters are less likely to insist on better working conditions and pay. As the country struggles with corruption and political instability, there is little hope of better government monitoring or enforcement, and responsibility for making trekking safe might fall on the visitors themselves. You're watching Arise News Now. Four seconds. That's what you get to make it happen. You can run the brake, find the big man inside, or swing it out and hit the three. Grab the board, and you get a new 24, just like that. And unfortunately, for endangered animals, there's no reset. Many are now facing extinction. And when their clock runs out, they're gone forever. So please, support conservation, and never buy products made from these animals. There's no more time to waste. Nigerian musician Fela Kuti, who died in 1997, is known the world over as the father of Afrobeat. It's a fusion of Yoruba rhythms, funk, jazz, and Nigerian highlife. Artist Lemmy Gariokwu, who drew all of his album covers over three decades, reflects on working with the musician icon. Ruben Easy has the story. Images that came to define a legend. Album covers of the Nigerian musician Fela Kuti, who died in 1997. The artist who produced them, Lemmy Gariokwu, is not such a familiar name, and yet he too is part of the Fela Kuti story. Fela was a thought provoker, and Lemmy was always able to translate that thought provoking um, theme that Fela represented in his music to visual art. So they were perfect pairs. Fela's, uh, Fela's mission and his um, advocacy was musical, where Lemmy's was visual. Throughout his 40-year career, Lemmy has produced a huge array of contemporary art, including more than 2,000 album covers. But it was his years with Fela which made his name. Uh, the body of works um, of album covers that I designed for the music career of Fela and Nicolas Bokuti, the Afrobeat legend. Um, I had designed um, most of his album covers. Uh, specifically, I designed 26 of his album covers in his, in, you know, for his uh, musical career. Uh, spanning three decades, the 70s, 80s and part of the 90s. Lemmy's works have been exhibited in New York and Paris, but he still works in Lagos, where he has a studio and also curates a museum dedicated to, who else, Fela Kuti. The Kuti family, they invited me and they said, uh, you know, uh, no one else uh, would do better to be the curator of the museum. So I, I received that <laughs> a challenge very gladly. The museum's based in Kalakuta, 
the Lagos house where Lemmy lived as part of Fela's entourage, which also included his 27 wives and his children. It's now a magnet for fans and a fitting tribute from the man who helped define Fela Kuti's visual style. Thank you for watching Arise News Now.